Okay. Here we go. Hi, Mark. Is it better? It is. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, no echo. Uh, and okay. I, I, re I told everyone to be patient because I really want to know what you're thinking in here, Mark. Last time you were here, you said you were reconstituted Euro Bear. Uh, Euro still holding the lows from last March and. Uh, looks like we have some stop hunts, taking out stops over 960, maybe one 10980, and the grand prize would be above 11080, which was the highs soon after the disappointing Draghi ECB press conference. So uh, great to have you with us, Mark. Uh, what are you thinking in here with the dollar selling off? Is this a dollar buying opportunity? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit frustrated with, with the price action. Uh, I do recognize, of course, that the market thinks that even though Yellen is dovish, they think that the Federal Reserve will not raise rates not just four times that the Fed says, but the market's not even pricing in a one rate hike. And so I, I think this is taking a toll. My, my sense is that in the big picture, though, here's what happens. If you're a bank and you have extra liquidity and you bring it to the Federal Reserve, they're going to pay you 50 basis points. You bring it to the ECB and they charge you 30 basis points. The German yield curve is negative out to uh, seven years. The Japanese curve is negative to eight years. And so I, I can't explain exactly what's going on here. I see stops being triggered. I see us moving to the upper end of the Euro's range that we've been in since early December. i just hesitant to say that this is the, uh, this is the beginning of a big uh, bull market for the Euro. Uh, I still think that come uh, middle of March, the ECB could still ease policy, cutting the deposit rate further beyond negative 30 basis points. So I, I think, of course, we have to respect the price action, and that's why we have stops, and that's why the, the key, it seems to me, and this is, I think, a point that you often make, Dale, is that the key is really risk management, money management. Get it, predicting the future is a small part and perhaps even an unimportant part of how to make money in the markets. Okay, so uh, it's very possible. I know there were some people looking for 113, 114. To complete in Elliott wave terms, one you know wave four, which implies another one to the downside. So we could be setting up a great dollar buying opportunity. Uh, the other part of the equation was Corota coming in, and we had that graveyard save in U.S. dollar yen at 116 when the S and P's were down 500 a week and a half ago. Mark and uh, we're back underneath where the BOJ where Corota came in and made that announcement on the move to negative rates. So um, perhaps what we have going here is uh, people losing confidence in central banks. For it to give up those gains so quickly, uh, what's your take on it? Yeah, I mean, so when I try to, uh, when I try to uh, forecast or even understand what the yen is doing, I tend to look at a few variables. One is a 10-year interest rate differential. And as you know, uh, the U.S. year yield uh, is down about 40 basis points this year. Uh, the second right. thing I look at for the uh, to try to that I think are drivers for the yen is the stock market. And so what I would say is that the easier BOJ monetary policy that caught us by surprise on Friday last week has not been enough to lift global equity markets. And so I, I, it's not the story. I, I tend to disagree with people who call the yen the safe haven. I don't think that's what's happening, and it's not what's happening with the euro either. I think what's happening is that people have used, that is, when I say people, I mean some of the uh, retail speculators, but really the large pools of capital like the hedge funds, CTAs, other players in the market have in effect borrowed euros, borrowed yen to buy other things like equities, like bonds, uh, like emerging markets. And as those markets go south, they have to unwind the whole position. That is, the reason that the yen is strengthening is not because people are buying yen as a way to find a a way to hide out and preserve capital. It's really the, as they exit trades, and these trades are complicated, and they're cross currencies across asset classes. And so my sense is that the euro and yen strength is the unwinding of risk assets. Whether it's long, think about what happened: long Aussie, uh, short yeah. euro, short yen, uh, long Canadian, uh, short Canadian dollars, a uh, big right. squeeze. And so I think that these positions are being unwound, and that's really the driver here. I don't think that's fundamentals. Again, I, I, for me, the key fundamental is interest rate differentials. And even if the Fed does not raise interest rates at all this year, of course, there'll be some adjustment 
but the fact of it is that the interest rate differential still favors the U.S. dollar. Okay, so, uh, so I, I do. Go ahead. I, I was just just finishing the thought that I do I do recognize uh, that uh, there there are the technicals. That's what I mean about respecting the price action. I had noted a, uh, a head and shoulders top in the yen, which projects actually I think to the uh, below 110. Yes. And like the uh, like the head and shoulders bottom in the Aussie, I didn't think that we'd reach our objective, which I believe the Aussie's objective is near 72.50 on that head and shoulders bottom. Right. I don't I don't think we reached there, but sort of second guessing the technicals. You know. Uh, thank you so much because uh, the request to bring you back was uh, your your top shelf in knowing about money flows. So that that gives us an understanding that euro strength and what's happening in the yen is based upon the unwinding of the carry trade, and the main driver of unwinding that carry trade uh, probably has been a two-way street happening, and maybe even more of a one-way street in S and P's. Um, bonds still performing uh, uh, quite well. So, is it possible that it's going to take stabilization of the equity markets or the dollar, or is it the tail wagging the dog that dollar stability will bring money flows back into U.S. assets, not just bonds but equities, and the dollar could resume its uptrend? Because the dollar's been trying for a long time to get through that par level mark and Every attempt has failed so far. I think it needs to do that. Uh, what are you thinking here? Yeah, no, I, I agree. With you. I, I, here's what I'm, I'm kind of thinking. You know, the, the first thing about what happens: uh, people come back from New Year's, and and I'm talking about people who are looking like asset managers, fund managers, pension fund managers, and the, and so they're not prepared the very first day of the year to buy because people don't buy the first day of the year. They want to get their like sea legs back underneath them, and what happens is that first day of the year, the Nikkei the German DAX and the S&P 500 all gapped lower. And I tend to put a lot of importance in gaps. It's my experience in the futures market. I watch those gaps closely. To me, that was a very bearish sign. But the driver at the time, remember that first week of the year, the driver, people said, was China. Right. Now it seems that in the past couple of weeks, it looks almost like the Chinese currency is uh, repegged to the dollar. It's been in such narrow trading ranges. Uh, the, uh, the rally in the Chinese stocks yesterday did not fuel stock market gains in the U.S. yesterday. And so I think the first step was decoupling from China. And now I think that we're, people are so focused on oil prices that I think uh, so now we've become decoupled from China. And now I think slowly we've got to become decoupled from oil. And I think that that might take some time as well because that's really been the uh, such high correlations. People are reluctant to fade that quite yet, even though over the long term the correlation is not so tight. So I think that we, we need to see we need to see a couple of things fall into place. We need to see the market stay decoupled from China. And as you know, China is going to go on a, an extended vacation next week for the Lunar New Year. So China is really right. going to be out of the equation for a week. We've got to watch those oil prices. And I think that we're already seeing, uh, say, the Canadian dollar uh, become yes. a little bit more decoupled from oil prices. So that's a healthy sign. And I think that what we have to be looking at, and I, I try to think this through, I mean, not just, it's sort of like, a, for me, a chess game. And not just thinking about the next move, but thinking about, couple moves down the line. And so I think about what kind of bottom should we be looking for? Some people said that this move was not driven by fundamentals and we should have a V-shaped bottom. I didn't really buy into that. Some people say it really is driven by fundamentals. We should have an L-shaped bottom. That is, we have a sell-off and we just don't have a recovery. I'm not convinced that's the case either with the ECB and the Bank of Japan in a very aggressive easing modes. And even with the Federal Reserve with a 25 basis point rate hike, I think the Fed is still ha it's hard to say that 25 basis points is tight money money supply or tight money monetary policy. I think we've gone right. from super accommodative to very accommodative. And so I'm thinking that we should have a W-shaped bottom. Okay. And so I think We're that's what getting, we're really carving out. Getting the whole alphabet here, Mark. So uh, anything with zero. W. So W, no, that's great. So W implies a few retests of or at least one retest, retest of the recent low. Uh, exactly, so, and that might be what okay. we're experiencing. Okay, yeah, that that's a great analogy. Um, so when you talk about things like the decoupling, because the yuan has stabilized, why are people using the Hong Kong dollar as a proxy now that uh, the, the slide in the yuan has stopped? People have been pressing the short side of the Hong Kong dollar, and actually the Hong Kong market has been under severe pressure. Um, as a proxy, 
Why are they doing that? Because you know, they don't want to fight uh, uh, the PBOC? Uh, I think I think almost to the contrary. I think that in effect, what's happening is I think there is uh, judging this from reports I've read. I mean, at Brown Brothers, uh, our client base in foreign exchange is real money. These are pension funds, mutual funds, unit trusts, life insurance companies. So I don't see the hedge fund flows the way I used to at other banks I've worked at. But reading the stories on Bloomberg and Dow Jones and Reuters, it seems to me quite clear that the hedge funds have amassed a very basically a speculative attack by the hedge funds on China. They think the Chinese currency is overvalued, Chinese stocks are overvalued, they're trying to sell it. China's central bank, Chinese government, is in effect fighting these hedge funds and speculators. And the first thing they did, basically, it seems to me, is they tried to squeeze on the China side. Right. The locals there, limiting capital outflows, uh, punishing banks. Uh, now, they shifted the, the front of the battle to Hong Kong. And as you know, the Chinese have two currencies, really. They have the onshore renminbi, we call it CNY, and the offshore right. renminbi, we call it CNH. So speculators are really focused on the CNH market. And in order to squeeze them out of the CNH, that is the short, the offshore RMB. In order to squeeze them out, the Chinese officials, the PBOC officials, have had to really work hard, not just intervention, but in effect what they did is, is, is try to trigger a big short squeeze. And this is to jack up money market rates in Hong Kong to make it very expensive to get funding and to be able to short the offshore RMB. And so I think that what's happening in Hong Kong is partly a function, largely a function, of China trying to squeeze out speculators. And remember what happened initially. Initially, that money leaving China was going to Hong Kong. And this is ironic in a way, right? If I take my money and go to New Jersey, it hardly counts as an export from the U.S., a capital flow from the U.S. <laughs> Hong Kong, the, the problem is that China has Hong Kong and they haven't, don't have an open capital account. So they want to treat the money in Hong Kong differently than they treat, they, differently than they treat money in China mainland. At the same time, this is not uh, just about money, but think about trade. China considers exports to Hong Kong exports. But yet when New York sells stuff to New Jersey or to Massachusetts, it's not an export. So a lot of this, I think, is China sort of struggling with its uh, a little Frankenstein that it created by having this onshore and offshore market. The best solution for China would be to open up its capital account and to get rid of the CNH market completely. But this is a big step for China, and here's why. You know, I think that many of your, many of the listeners and viewers can appreciate this. I began my career on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and you know where they trade the currency futures? Right next yes. to the livestock futures. <laughs> right next to the pork bellies, live cattle. And right. as a, most central bankers don't want their money to be treated like that. They think that of all the prices that an economy gener generates, the price of money is the most important. And so most countries don't really embrace what the U.S. often argues for, and that is letting markets determine exchange rates. So the Chinese are wrestling with this. They're not about to adopt free market mechanisms for its currency. And so I think that part of this is a uh, the ramification cost the only thing that's China, and that's Hong Kong, rather. Okay. Yeah, what a great explanation, Mark. Uh, great clarity for what is really opaque in China. Um, I'd like to uh, pose a question, get your view. There are, you know, with this ongoing strong dollar, ongoing weak crude market, putting immense pressure on emerging markets. Uh, the emerging markets would welcome a weakening dollar. Um, many countries would, as well as a recovery in crude oil prices. And interest rates don't seem to be the fix. But you and I were around in 19... 85 for the Plaza Accord. Yeah. Is it possible that it, we're going to have something like this in the works should the dollar break out over 100, put more pressure on emerging markets and commodity prices, that the central banks will get together, cooperate, and not use interest rates as a tool, but you say that the U.S. rarely intervenes in currency markets, but they were a big intervention player in the Plaza Accord. Do you think we could have a Plaza Accord 2.0? Well, I, I suppose we could. I mean, now that we have such negative interest rates, I suppose anything is possible. But I think that the lesson from the 0809 great financial crisis is that, you know, we did it, that we went through the crisis with very little foreign exchange intervention, especially among the major countries. So I think that the, one of the lessons learned is that 
it's probably that there might be other tools. And remember, at the time, uh, they developed these swap lines to provide this extra liquidity. But I'm not so sure that the G7 countries would would organize a plaza agreement to drive the dollar down against emerging market currencies. Many of those emerging market currencies, in some ways, I want to say that the weakness of those emerging market currencies, while it's very painful for investors, is probably more of a solution, part of the solution, for these emerging market countries. Think about it, many of these, when we think about emerging markets, many times we think about commodity producing countries. And that's especially in Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, Peru, Chile, Colombia. So they've been hit, like Australia and Canada, have been hit with a terms of trade shock. The price of their exports have collapsed. And a weaker currency is partly a way to deal with that. And I think that the other problem is, and we've seen this movie before, Dale, right? Here's what happens. Yeah. U.S. interest rates are low, so, uh, and the dollar is weak, so foreign central banks, foreign governments, foreign companies borrow dollars. They have a currency mismatch. They bring that money home because it's cheaper to borrow dollars than it, and swap back into the local currency than raise local currency debt itself. So things go fine until they stop. And that is commodity prices sell off as they invariably do. The dollar strengthens as invariably it does sooner or later. And now these countries and companies have this big currency mismatch. And that's what I would say about China as well. Part of the capital outflows from China, part of the capital outflows from the emerging market countries are companies and governments paying back their dollar debt, trying to retire some of their dollar debt, or service it at least, because it's so expensive. It's more expensive than it was initially, especially when they have depreciating currencies. Every time, when you think about emerging market crisis, almost every emerging market crisis has been preceded by tighter Fed policy because we're in this big cycle and and sort of like uh, by why I look at chart analysis even though I'm a fundamentalist I'm an economist strategist I look at the charts because of the basic principle that as smart as we might be as individuals as a group or as a crowd we can't seem to get out of our own way and we keep repeating certain things which is why patterns work crowds continue to repeat themselves and I think that this emerging market crisis is one of these patterns. And this is, uh, so I think that the stronger dollar really is partly an effect and partly a cause of the problems they have. I don't look for a new plaza agreement. I think that uh, what the ECB is telling us is that they're going to be easing policy at least uh, until March of next year. The Bank of Japan doesn't even have an exit strategy yet. And I'm not sure we're at the peak yet of their easing. And so it seems to me that the, when we can get that kind of plaza agreement type of scenario, I think, is when we're at the end of the rope with the ECB. When the ECB says, okay, uh, our QE has worked, uh, we're now going to begin uh, with a taper, we're going to begin uh, raising interest rates. And same thing for Japan. And I'm afraid to say that I think we might be uh, years away from that happening. Okay, so uh, let me uh, ask you about this. Uh, on a geopolitical level, the Saudis are very unhappy about us and our nuclear accord with Iran. They're in an oil war. Uh, their budgets are stretched. Uh, is it possible that because of the falling out between U.S. and Saudi Arabia, they went into Yemen of their own accord, that a depegging of the real from the U.S. dollar uh, is a possible game changer if they decide, become that desperate to go ahead and do it? And you think that is? A possibility for other nations to depeg from the dollar. Uh, we've only had, besides China, this was kind of a depeg by letting the yuan float. Uh, the only other country I've seen do it is Azerbaijan, so a very small country. Uh, <laughs> do you think it's possible that some of these EMs, and uh, I think if the Saudis do it, it would be a game changer for global markets? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because I I say a couple of things. One is I think from the from the U.S. perspective, they've often I mean at the G7 and the G20, the U.S. has been able to sort of win the win the debate and have both organizations, the G7 and the G20, endorse floating exchange rates. So I think that I think that many in the U.S. Treasury would would welcome floating exchange rates from Middle East countries. Uh, so I'm not so sure that it breaking if the Saudis were to break its peg, I know that the markets would be up in up in arms about it. Uh, but I'm not so sure that the U.S. Treasury would be that opposed to it. Second thing I'd say is that the Saudis have lived through much more difficult times and kept the peg. The Saudis are not pegging to the dollar because they like the U.S. or because uh, because of uh, Operation Desert Shield, the first Iraq War, 
Yes. I think they do it because they see it's in their self-interest. And imagine what would happen to the Saudi economy if they were to let the currency apparently depreciate. I think it would be a, a greater hardship for the Saudis. They, remember, they, imp they export oil. The, ex the export of oil doesn't really depend so much on where the real is trading against the U.S. dollar. The Saudis have stopped, it looks like, uh, we can't tell Saudis per se, but OPEC countries are not buying the kind of treasury bond that they used to buy. Right. Of course, I think from the U.S. Treasury perspective, the government would probably be happier if the Saudis would buy more U.S. goods and services and buy fewer U.S. Treasury bonds. So in the, but specifically, Dale, I do not expect either the Hong Kong peg or the Saudi peg to be, uh, to, to, uh, be abandoned anytime soon. And Could this know, we... might have a time... Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, but before I got involved in the markets, I believe it was in the late 70s, there was some talk, and I haven't been able to verify this because a lot of people don't report what's going on in the Middle East so much in the finance, but I'm under the impression that, the, that there was some pressure on the Saudi peg at one point. And rather than devalue, First, the Saudis revalued and basically crushed all the people that were betting for devaluation. And after these people were wiped out, then they proceeded to devalue the currency. So sounds I like think the, that what the Chinese have shown Sounds us, like the SNB. Yeah. What the Chinese the have SNB shown us. Yep, yeah, what the Swiss have shown us, and I think what the Bank of Japan showed us last week is that if you if you're a speculator and you're betting against the central banks. You've got to pick your shots very carefully. The central banks still hold, it's sort of like the golden rule, right? He with the gold makes the rules. Central banks have the gold, they have the power, and they, can, they have the will at times to express frustration and anger at speculators. And I, I know a lot of people that have lost a lot of money over the years fighting the central banks. It is much more difficult now. I actually remember a trader on the IMM. His last name was Bregman. Do you remember him? He used to take on the banks and uh, uh, used to fade central banks. It seems like it's uh, been a losing game in the last uh, central planning episode. Do you think, Mark, that part of the dollar weakness from last spring or stability has been due to uh, energy weakness because we are a petrol currency and less demand for crude or uh, less petrol dollars uh, coming into uh, a bear market in crude has taken one of the legs of support out from the dollar and if we ever got a recovery in oil that could be a prop to reinstate King Dollar? Yeah, I don't know. You know, people I remember when oil prices back in two thousand and eight were about hundred and fifty dollars a barrel and people said this was bad for the US. The US is a big energy consu consumer. And even yeah. now, when we think about our production, we're only producing about half of our need. I'd hardly call the dollar a petrol currency, but I think you know you raise a good point, and there's another methodological point. For me, the, like, how big is the foreign exchange market? It's roughly 5.2 trillion dollars a day. Wow. That, and that, the important thing about that is that capital flows then outstrip trade flows. So when I try to think about which way currencies should go, major currencies like the dollar, the yen, the euro, sterling. I tend not to focus so much on trade in goods and services. I tend to focus on those things that attract or detract capital. And so for me, I'd say that my, my sense about what's happening with oil is that, and I, I mistake this as well, I mean, I thought that the drop in oil price was going to be good for the U.S. economy. And I didn't really take into account the sort of the sequence of events. It's, I think it is good for the U.S. economy. Look at what happened to auto sales. Last year, record auto sales. And part of that is fueled by low interest rates, people having jobs, but also low price of gasoline. But I think what's happened with the oil is that the, the first, it's sort of like there's good news and there's bad news. And first we get the bad news. It hurts industrial production. It hurts capital expenditures. It hurts durable good orders. So, you know, you run, you know, it weighs on the manufacturing sector. But it seems to me that looking at the, uh, the ISM for manufacturing, a couple of the, the, the internals, the number of industries that are really contracting is about a third. Typically in a recession, you get uh, closer. You get over half of them are contracting. And I also look at this uh, uh, this sort of an indicator. I'm looking at the relationship between inventory accumulation and new orders. And, and both of those measures, the inventories and new orders and their relationship, are really suggesting to me that the U.S. manufacturing sector is about to turn. Uh, that might be turning now, or it's going to turn shortly. 
and, and so that means I think that we've already paid for the bad news for oil, the drop in oil prices. We already know what's happening to the energy uh, bonds, to the, to the high yield bond market. We know what's happening to jobs in uh, North Dakota, for example. But now I think what we should be anticipating is the payoff. And I'm not crazy. I mean, I'm a, I'm a bit green in the sense that I worry that the low price of gasoline uh, makes, makes my friends tease me that I have a Prius. And then what happens to environmental issues and what happens to our movement towards a more uh, a, a, a lower carbon use economy? I think that's the big race in the future, and I think there's a drop in oil prices that is a disservice in the long run. But in the short run, I'm not so sure that if the dollar were to take off now, I think it would be, if, I'm sorry, if oil were to take off now, I think it would be good for the U.S. because we are one of the few countries that can actually raise interest rates. And that would probably help uh, encourage the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates if we see oil prices uh, moving higher. Even though the Fed says that the impact is transitory, I think they've also identified that they'd like to see inflation rising before they raise rates again. Okay, well, Mark, you know, I'd like to wrap it up with the silly season. Um, where are you going to point your Prius? In what direction? Are you going to go to a Bernie Sanders rally, uh, <laughs> a Hillary Clinton rally, a Donald Trump rally, a Ted Cruz rally? Where's that Prius going, buddy? Yeah, well, you know, I, I come from Chicago, and we have two rules in Chicago: Chicago vote politics. Often? Uh, vote early, vote often. No, <laughs> what I was thinking really is uh, uh, make no waves, back no losers. And so, for as an investor, I'm not so. I have to separate who I wish to win from who yes. I think is going to win. And I think it's going to be very hard. And I think that's important when we think about Fed policy too. You know, everybody seems to have an opinion about what the Fed should do. Everybody seems to have an opinion what the New York Giants should do, or what the Yankees should do, or even what my Chicago Cubs should do. But <laughs> instead of having an opinion of what they ought to do, I t I spend a lot of my time thinking about what they will do. And so, when I think about the U.S. presidential election, I think it's going to be very difficult. Barring a, a significant, like an indictment of Hillary Clinton, to uh, for the Democrats to lose his presidential campaign, I think that the Republican Party is doing almost everything it could possibly do to alienate large constituencies, not just for today but in the future. I think about women, young people, Hispanics, and so I have to. I think that, uh, regardless of my own ideology, I think that the Democrats have a better handle on gaining those constituencies. So I think they will have a Hillary victory in November, but I'm not so sure that it changes a U.S. Treasury policy. I don't think it has much impact on U.S. monetary policy. I think social policy, perhaps trade issues, maybe we'll have to revisit the TPP a little bit, uh, but for, for my outlook for the dollar, it doesn't really matter so much who wins the White House. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, great to have you back again. I'm wishing you a great 2016 that pips fall, fall on you and that it's a flood that follows you throughout the year and your followers and thank you so much for your tweet today and I'm so glad that I've been able to help or serve in any way I admire and respect you Mark and I'm proud to call you my trading warrior brother and Chicago brother as well. Yes, thank Chicago. You. Thank you very much Dale. Good luck. Good luck to everybody. Thank you Mark.